from the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature you Good morning and welcome to worship here at Bethel Lutheran Church in Winchester, Virginia. Hi, I'm Pastor Dave Young and I'm delighted that you are in worship with us this morning. Please know that from wherever you are watching worship this morning that all are welcome. And to help us best welcome you, I invite you to uh, send us an email. Let us know you are in worship with us this morning and how we best might be able to minister with you. Today we are having a congregational meeting via Zoom, and the link was sent out to all the members, either with an email or uh, uh, in a letter that was sent to you at your home. We hope you can join us today uh, for, it uh, won't be a very long meeting, but it'll be an opportunity to be able to see each other and connect and to check in and hear about more of the wonderful things that are happening here at Bethel uh, that have happened and the wonderful way that you've continued to be a great support for our ministry. So hopefully you'll join us for that. Again, welcome to this fifth Sunday in, after Epiphany, and we gather now as we do every morning for worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Let us now confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all of our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all that we have done and left undone. Even before the words are, are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them now in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and the promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. And in the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Let us pray. Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, that your good news may be made known to the ends of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. My name is Ella Carlson, and I will be doing the reading and the prayer today. The first reading is from 1 Corinthians. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. For an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I might have become all things to all people, that I might be, by all means have some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share it in its blessings. Here ends the reading. The Gospel reading is from Mark. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here ends the gospel.
Friends, grace to you and peace from God who is our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, our Messiah. Amen. Now, if I were to ask you this question, what is a Christian? How might you respond? To be sure, there are a lot of different answers that we could give. The way that I would answer this question is this. A Christian is one who has responded to God's baptismal welcome to new life by adopting the lifestyle of a disciple of Jesus Christ. The lifestyle of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, have you ever thought of the faith, our Christian faith, as a lifestyle? Well, in a very real sense it is, because being a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, will certainly affect the way that we live our lives in this world. It is no coincidence that the earliest Christians were known as the people of the way. As recorded in the book of Acts, St. Paul refers to the early Christian community as the way eight different times. The early Christian community had no doctrine, at least no stated doctrine, no creeds, no formal legislative bodies as we know it today. Yet they were distinguishable from others because of their lifestyle. It was how they lived that signaled to others that they were followers of Jesus. A Christian, then, is one who recognizes that our relationship with Jesus is the first priority of life and that our relationship with Christ is the God for our life. And all other relationships and priorities are shaped by this first primary relationship with Jesus. Our relationships with our family, our relationships with our friends, our relationships with our our neighbors, our strangers, with our enemies. The first relationship with Jesus is primary and definitive. And it also shapes we live our lives in these relationships. It shapes how we live our lives in our professions. It shapes how we make decisions concerning where we live, how we live, what we own, what we wear, what we share, and with whom we spend our time, and on whom and with whom we spend our resources. In effect, our relationship with Christ influences, to be sure, our lifestyle. Therefore, I believe that each of us must continually ask ourselves, does our lifestyle signal to others that we are disciples of Jesus Christ? Well, to answer that question, perhaps we should think about what makes up a decidedly Christian lifestyle. And the answers to this will vary, to be sure. But as we have done here at Bethel, we have Uh, signal the marks of discipleship as that which guides uh, our Christian discipleship. And the marks of discipleship are prayer, worship, the reading and engaging of Scripture, serving others, our neighbors, those around the world, those locally, um, relating to other Christians and people in the community in a way that's life-giving and... and, um, and giving of our time, talent, and resources for the building up of the kingdom. Those are the six marks of discipleship, the faith practices, if you will, that we have engaged in as the people of faith. And so I often hearken us back to that because I ask this question, imagine what Bethel would look like. What about our world, what Winchester might look like um, if we and what we might accomplish in our mission if we were able to live into these faith practices with conviction. And the one of all the faith practices, the one that I think is most indispensable for the disciple is the one that I want to focus on today, which is seen it specifically in our gospel lessons today, but is the faith practice of prayer. Now, for today's purposes, you can also think about it as connection with God. Um, how do you fill your well um, with the baptismal waters of Jesus and his promises in your life? 
Where are you being fed and nourished so that you can then have the energies to be about the work of God. And another way of saying it is that, the, is that prayer or these experiences of, of connecting with God, that is the fuel source for the Christian lifestyle. It is the ongoing conversation between disciple and Lord. Think of the most valuable relationships that you have in your life, whether it is with your, your spouse, your best friends, a parent, a sibling, a grandparent, a child, a friend. Now, what, think for a second, what would that relationship look like? Would it be anywhere near as fulfilling if you never communicated with that person? Or only rarely for just moments a day or only for an hour on Sundays? What if your communication with them or their communication with you consisted only of times when you were either, when you either wanted something from the other or when you were angry or uncertain about the other (laughs) my guess is that it would not only be not as good of a relationship it probably wouldn't be much of one at all (laughs) yet how often is that the relationship the conversation that we have with christ either we come to christ in our desperation and need and of course i hope you do because the lord wants you to And indeed, sometimes we come to the Lord in our exasperation and frustration and and uncertainty. And of course, the Lord wants us to do that too. But the Lord also wants our good days. The Lord also wants our mundane days. The Lord wants all of our days. Indeed, the Lord values all of our days. And indeed, in the midst of any experience, coming to the Lord, I believe, sharpens our discipleship so that we can most fully be filled to do the work of modeling our life after him. In our relationship with Jesus, I would, in, I would submit to you that, our, that maturity as a Christian demands that our prayer life, our ongoing relationship with him is at least as good, if not better, than the best of our relationships on earth and and why is that because for for the disciple for the one who seeks to follow jesus the relationship with him becomes the norm by which the rest of our life is lived living in relationship with god through prayer is not only vital to the christian disciple but it is essential to our growth and maturity in faith our our scripture lesson today speaks to that centrally It is one of my most favorite gospel stories. Prayer is not just a scheduled event. It is a part of a lifestyle, and our gospel lesson shares that in a real way. Notice, if you will, at the beginning and at the end of our text, all the activity that surrounds Jesus in the gospel lesson. He spends the day curing sick people and casting out demons. He has a busy day. We are are told that all the town comes in to be near him. Imagine the energy that it must have taken to be present for all of those people. You know it yourself when you're really fully present with someone that's exhausting. And oftentimes it can be a grind. But, But we do it. And why do we do it? We do it because it's what the Lord calls us to do as the people of God. We do that because it is, it, it is what it means to live in the life of faith. And Jesus was no exception. He, he must have been exhausted after curing the people and, and casting out demons for all the town that day. And then he goes to bed, <laughs> probably indeed overwhelmed in so many ways. And then we are told this, that Jesus got up and left the house and went off to a lonely place, and there he prayed. Then, in the midst of his prayer, what happens? Well, he's interrupted by Saint Simon Peter and the disciples who tell him that he was needed and they must go. And Jesus gets up and goes immediately to preach and cast out more demons in Galilee, he, for he says, this is why I have come, notice that amidst all of this action, one little verse is hidden. And we'd be so easy just to 
just to skip right over it. But he got up and left the house and went off to a lonely place, and there he prayed. The late Roman Catholic theologian and author, who many of you are familiar with, Henry Nouwen, writes this about this text. He says, the more I read this nearly silent sentence, locked in between the loud words of action, the more I have the sense that the secret of Jesus' ministry is hidden in that lonely place where he prayed. Friends, no matter when we do it, no matter how long we engage in it, prayer and connecting with God is the fuel source that allows us to live our lives most fully in relationship with God. Most fully in the midst of the hectic, nature of life. Jesus knew this. He modeled this, and it's what fueled his life of obedience to the Father. We see we need only look ahead to the night before his passion when he's praying in Gethsemane, that before he goes to take on the most, the most strenuous, most difficult activity that any one has ever taken on, the passion and the cross, that he sought his Lord's support. That he went there for, to give him what he needed to face even a most difficult, dangerous, and desperate moment. Jesus knew this, and it fueled his life of obedience to the Father from beginning to the end. In the midst of his hectic schedule, Jesus always takes time to relate to God so that he was able to best live his life in accordance to God's will and call and purpose that has been given him. New, New and Henry Nouwen goes on again to say, in the lonely place, Jesus finds the courage to follow God's will and not his own, to speak God's words and not his own, to do God's work and not his own. You see, friends, that is the same promise given to us. Your own connection to God, your own prayer life, those moments that you spend with God is in effect your fuel source for living your life. Henry Nouwen concludes by saying these words. The careful balance between silence and words, withdrawal and involvement, distance and closeness, solitude and community forms the basis of the Christian life and should therefore be subject to our most personal attention. How is your prayer life? How is your relationship with God? Where are the places and the moments that you are being refueled and re-energized so that you can recommit every day to reimagining what God is doing in your life, to reorienting yourself toward God? the work and the purpose of Jesus Christ. Next Sunday is Transfiguration Sunday, and it's the final Sunday before Lenten season. And so I encourage you to involve yourself in our Lenten theme this year, Lent in Plain Sight. This week at Bethel sent out a link to where you can uh, uh, order the devotional book that we're using that is, that is shaping this. It's a book Lent in plain sight. And you, we will be offering opportunities for you as individuals and as families to connect deeply with God as we head towards Lent. And that's what I would ask for you today. That's what I would ask, invite you all to do during this season. Lent is an awesome time for us to reimagine, reorient, and recommit ourselves to this kind of prayer life, this kind of reconnection with God. A refueling, if you will, of discipleship. For you see, being a disciple of Jesus is a distinct lifestyle. It involves worship and service 
and community and laughing and sharing and generosity, but at the heart, at the core, is prayer and connecting with that God who has named you and claimed you as his own. So, what is a Christian? Well, it is one who responds to God by entering into a new lifestyle as a disciple of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, it all begins with prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us now confess our faith together with the words of our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church, for ministries of healing and wholeness, for hospital, hospice, and military chaplains, for those serving in pr prison ministry, for all who proclaim freedom and release in the name of Christ, let us pray. Have mercy, o God. For creation, for insects in the grass, clouds on the mountaintops, for cattle and the rainwater they drink, for the humility to take our place among all creatures of the earth, let us pray. For the nations, for all who lead in cities and towns, states and countries, for community organizers, school officials and CEOs, for international health organizations that in times of trial, feel, or hopelessness, they find freedom and service to those most in need. Let us pray. For all wearied by life's burdens, for those who are poor, for those lacking supportive relationships, for those crushed by debt, for those struggling with chronic pain or other sickness, for those exhausted from overwork or stress, and for all who cry out to you, let us pray. For this congregation, for outreach and social ministries centered here, for parish nurses and visitors, for ministries of companionship and support, for the young people in this place who open us to new understandings, let us pray. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed, who were called by name and now rest from their labors, that their lives serve as witnesses to the goodness of God, let us pray. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Friends, on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same manner, also, he took the cup after supper, he gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us sing now together the prayer. That our Lord taught us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. While we sing the Lord for the Lamb of God, you are invited to uh, get bread and wine from your own home and then share together uh, this, our family meal of Thanksgiving.
was the body of Christ given for you. Friends, the blood of Christ is shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever.